Good morning. I'm Anita Haberman. I'm president and CEO of the Surrey Board of Trade and welcome to this morning's Surrey Entrepreneur Showcase on this International Women's Week featuring our amazing Surrey women entrepreneurs. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional and unceded territory of our Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwantlen, Keitsi, Coquitlam, Keikut, Semiamu, and Tawasin First Nations. I'd also like to acknowledge that we live, learn, work, and play on the land of the Inuit and Métis peoples. I'd also like to acknowledge and recognize the global conflict that is taking place between Russia and Ukraine. We do have a Ukraine support page on our website at businessinsuri.com so that anyone who is wanting to provide support in whatever way you can, there are some very valuable resources on our website. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this event. Without sponsorship, Surrey Board of Trade events simply could not take place. Thank you so much to our supporting sponsor, Kwantlen Polytechnic University's Melville School of Business. Thank you so much. Our media sponsor, CBC Vancouver, and our progress partners, the Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plan represented by SNF Benefits, the law firm of Faskin, Scotiabank, BDC, the Business Development Bank of Canada, and Western Community College. Everyone, on March 8th, we celebrate International Women's Day each and every year, a global day celebrating women's historical, cultural, political, and social achievements. Given all of the challenges that we face in our various socioeconomic circumstances in the past and today, women are valuable pillars of society. And on International Women's Day, we also support gender equality, where everyone has access to the same rights and opportunities across all sectors and levels of society. Everyone, please help me welcome an amazing female broadcaster, your master of ceremonies for this morning. She's an award-winning journalist and the host of CBC weekday call-in show, BC Today, where she engages in conversations with listeners on the day's top stories and issues very important to British Columbians. She's been recognized by the Radio TV Digital News Association and the Jack Webster Foundation for stories that have delved into the opioid crisis in BC, as well as the immigrant experience in Canada and she's covered the 2017 NDP Green Deal for Minority Government in BC. Everyone, please help me welcome the amazing Michelle Elliott. Michelle, over to you. Anita, thank you so much for those kind words. I'm very excited to be here this morning and welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. It is absolutely my pleasure to be here today as your master of ceremonies for today's Surrey Entrepreneur Showcase, the Women Entrepreneur Panel. On behalf of the Surrey Board of Trade, I thank you for supporting Surrey's business organization. The Surrey Board of Trade is the city's city building business organization where business happens and they support and attract business through government advocacy, international trade, business support and a concierge of connections. They are making Surrey an opportunity city, a great place to live, to lurk, to learn and work and play. And as we all know, the road to success, it's not always easy. You can start your own business, that can be easy, but building a lasting and profitable business can be daunting and challenging. Now this Surrey Entrepreneur Showcase series featuring women entrepreneurs in Surrey will tackle the obstacles, the trials, the highs and the lows of that journey. And each path is different. This morning, you're gonna hear the path that these successful entrepreneurs have taken, what strategies have worked and what didn't. We're gonna hear their stories today. And we guarantee 
their stories will inspire all of you. Our panelists this morning represent various sectors from digital design and innovation, online retail, and manufacturing. And they will provide their perspectives on how they started their journey to their success. After that, it will be your turn to ask questions. The Surrey Board of Trade is asking for your participation in the dialogue, and that will follow the panel presentations. Let's get to our speakers, shall we? Our first speaker is a CEO, co-founder, and director of Conquer Experience, Inc. There, they believe that education and experience change healthcare. Please join me in welcoming Angela Robert. Hello. How, thank you so much, Michelle. Should I uh, jump into my story now or are you going to introduce all the panelists? Jump in? Please do go ahead. Yes. Okay, perfect. It's great to meet you and really excited to be part of this panel of uh, other great female entrepreneurs and leaders in the community. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes to go through the story. So I'm um, going to start off talking a little bit about um, where I grew up because I'm not native. Like many people I know um, did not grow up necessarily in Vancouver and moved to the Vancouver and Surrey, greater Vancouver area in Surrey, um, you know, post-graduation or um, after university. So where I grew up originally was in Manitoba and it was a tiny town of 200 people. Um, it was, you know, a great experience. Everyone knew everyone. So that uh, added a, an interesting dynamic to growing up. Um, another neat thing about um, where I grew up is we were able to do a lot of um, jobs because there wasn't necessarily a lot of people to do all the jobs. So one of the things I like to talk about is I, before I graduated high school, I had 18 different jobs. Some of them were part of a family business um, and some were, you know, tied to where my parents worked, uh, but others I, you know, achieved um, on my own as well. Now, after, <clears throat> after graduation and even in high school, I was one of those um, funny people who would wake up at 6.30 in the morning, go to school and um, do computer science. So uh, we got a lab of computers. Uh, and so when I was about 16, I would go into work really early and completely became addicted to technology. And you know, before that, I didn't even have a computer in our house, or we barely had a computer. And uh, so really, really grasped onto that. And I had a, a really great teacher in high school that helped, um, you know, helped me um, take advantage of all those resources. And um, I was fortunate enough to get in, I had really great marks overall, but really great marks in math. So I was able to get into the University of Waterloo, moved out to Ontario and did my degree there and, um, you know, doing computer science at Waterloo with a math degree, I learned about video games and, and building video games. And I wasn't a big gamer. I knew of games, video games were interesting to me, but I ended up getting a computer science, uh, the computer science degree and really focusing on um, building software, um, you know, with a, more of a game-based background. Now, <clears throat> when I graduated um, from university, I was part of a co-op program. So I had more work experience, which was really great. I had two years work experience working in, uh, in Toronto, doing some financial, um, some financial software applications, worked for Scotiabank and a mutual fund software company. Uh, but post-graduation, before I graduated that October, I ended up getting a job at Electronic Arts out in Vancouver, Burnaby, um, which I was really, really excited about. And um, I remember on graduation, you know, just thinking about business and entrepreneurship, I said, you know, I would never um, be an entrepreneur. I would never have my own company as I'm graduating. And I said this to all my best friends, which we laugh at now. Um, and so after, uh, you know, working at Electronic Arts, so I worked uh, out in Burnaby, for about five years on, on many different game titles. Um, you know, I absolutely loved the technology. I love the people, I love the creativity, but the impact wasn't there. So um, that's when I really started thinking about um, starting my own business. And my grandfather passed away at the time and uh, around the time where I made the decision to, to look at entrepreneurship. And I realized at his um, celebration of life or funeral, that many people in my family were entrepreneurs. So I was like, if they can do it, why can't I do it? 
And uh, so then, you know, around uh, around that time, um, mobile apps, we started talking about mobile apps. This was before the iPhone. This is when Blackberries were around and I had, you know, Blackberry at the time. So I got really passionate about, uh, you know, things that you can do on these mobile devices. And then, um, you know, what also happened was that, um, you know, the Olympics were coming to Canada or to the Vancouver area. And um, I ended up, um, you know, the iPhone launched as well. And I thought, oh, we could, you know, build some apps for the Olympics. And I ended up connecting with someone I met at a networking event. And uh, around that time, I started a company just thinking about um, building apps for travel purposes. So you know, this is, you arrive in a particular city and you need maps, you need to figure out where you're going, you need to know where to go shop and eat and all that kind of stuff. And this was before, you know, Google was really around in Google Maps and stuff. So um, we, uh, you know, I started developing some ideas around uh, building apps for for business purposes on these devices. And I partnered with um, another uh, entrepreneur and, uh, you know, we started building mobile apps and my first company conquer mobile before conquer experience, we had done over, um, we'd done over a uh, hundred different enterprise mobile applications, um, over about the period of five years in Vancouver, we, we were the leader, we ended up working with, um, Olivia Vincent um, and Cam Pages. So, um, and we built Google Voice Search uh, for businesses and mapping before Google did, which was was really really great. Now, in that first company where we were a services company and selling, um, you know, our services and, and helping people really uh, adopt and build mobile technology, um, you know, it, we're really trying to help them you know, bring their technology forward. I still wanted to do something that was my own. Um, and, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's never really your own because uh, you might have a lot of the concepts and ideas, but you really depend on the team. But at the at that point, it was like, I wanted something that maybe was the company's or ours. And we looked at um, a couple of different um, product ideas and both of them happened to be in, um, healthcare and I had been quoted saying, you know, I never wanted to do any business in healthcare uh, because it was a really hard market to get into. And, um, you know, we ended up working um, and meeting some people locally in Surrey um, around healthcare um, and simulation in healthcare. And what simulation in healthcare is, is um, clinicians, so people that, you know, take care of us in hospitals, um, what they do is before they actually treat a patient, they have to learn how to do it. So they go through different simulations, like a, say, for example, like a flight simulator, you, the pilots learn in a simulator before they fly a real plane. So the same thing happens, um, in healthcare. And so we, um, had met with a number of people in Surrey and were, you know, part of Innovation Boulevard and the Health and Technology District, um, as they were, you know, just starting in Surrey. And, um, we ended up incubating, um, a product concept and a product idea called PeriopSim. And it, um, and it's what the company today does primarily, um, which is training for operating room nurses. So, what we look at is, um, or what we provide, the problem we're solving is the surgeon is asking for an instrument, um, you know, from a nurse um, or a tech, and that nurse or tech has to provide that instrument to the surgeon at the right time and even hand things to the surgeon before the surgeon asks for it. And so we built a virtual reality and tablet-based experience where they put on the headset and they're, you know, pulled into the operating room. And, um, you know, one of the things, you know, when you think about creating um, a business, you're, it's all about solving a problem. And so one of the key problems is that, you know, surgeons get really frustrated with learners um, or, you know, even experienced people that have never done a surgery before, but with scheduling and, you know, um, shortages, staffing shortages, sometimes people are placed in teams to provide surgery to a patient and, you know, the person that's supporting the surgeon might not have done that procedure for like a year or never. 
Um, and so um, what our training system allows is for them to rehearse before they go into surgery. Um, and so um, that product is called Periopsim. And we ended up um, kind of fast forwarding a little bit. We ended up um, moving our product Periopsim um, into um, Conquer Experience. Um, which is the new company where we're 100% focused on um, periopsin and selling periopsin into healthcare. So health systems, departments of surgery, and we also sell them into schools that um, they supply new hires um, to health systems in Canada and um, in the U.S., but a lot of our business is in the U.S., Today we have um, on our platform have trained over 2,500 um, healthcare workers and with over 150,000 simulations, which is, it blows my mind. Um, during COVID, um, you know, it was really interesting because a lot of the, um, we ended up doing quite well during that period of time because what happened to our industry was that um, healthcare workers that were in the schools um, usually do um, job shadowing, um, residency type experience um, on the job training in hospitals. But with COVID, all of that was shut down. And so there were over 10,000 students that were in uh, these schools that did not know when they were going to graduate and did not know, you know, when they would be able to finish you know, finish their degree, get their clinical experience and even get hired, you know, into doing that work. And then in healthcare, all the operating rooms, everybody moved into other departments in the hospital. And so our solution came in really handy for those 10,000 that were waiting, um, you know, waiting in the schools uh, for their clinical experience. And we ended up um, building an at-home solution where they can access periopsin for most uh, most of their devices. And so educators, um, while they're balancing their kids at home and doing online learning um, and moving their entire curriculum online, um, they were able to use Periopsin really out of the box and, you know, have a really exciting and engaging experience. Um, one of the, one of the things that I'm going to mention, I'm just going to kind of wrap up here. I think I'm nearly out of time. Um, is that the solution uh, that we have, the platform we have is very engaging. So it's very similar to playing like a video game or very similar to in real life. And, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that um, is interesting in the education industry today. You know, I'm all about, you know, pushing the boundaries with technology. And um, this is really, you know, the forefront or, or one of the key areas when people use the term metaverse, um, this type of technology and these types of experiences, you know, what the future of education is going to be. The future is kind of here now, um, but we're going to see a lot more of that um, as the technology improves and there's more companies um, looking at different educational areas as well. Um, maybe just to wrap up here, I'll, I'll say, you know, it was interesting for me personally becoming an entrepreneur. I found that it's stressful, but it seems like it was less stress for me than having a job. Um, and you know, it's nice. It's, it's good and bad when, um, you know, everything starts and stops at you, um, so that, that's a really interesting um, part of having uh, or being an entrepreneur and having this role. Um, but it's also incredibly rewarding. So, you know, you're able to put a lot of your, uh, you know, blood, sweat and tears, a lot of your polish into what you're doing. And ultimately, you, you know, get to hire an amazing team to work with you and, um, you know, develop a lot of really, really great relationships Um you know, every day. And even we do a lot of working from home, but, uh, you know, we talk all the time. We're always on Zoom and I'm one of those people who don't mind being on Zoom all the time. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful for um, where I'm at right now. And I see, you know, there's a, you know, there's a potential for our company to be a billion dollar company. Um, and so um, I just got shivers. <laughs> So it's, you know, it's an exciting journey and, uh, 
yeah, every day is different and yeah, I'm grateful I can do what I can do. So thank you so much. I'll wrap there. Thank you so much, Angela. You got shivers. I was gasping as you, as you were speaking there. The technology is incredible. Uh, and uh, what an amazing journey to think that at one point you said you never wanted to be an entrepreneur. And here never say right. never. <laughs> never say never. That's right. Uh, thank yeah. you. That was that was absolutely inspiring. Uh, that's Angela Robert. Our next speaker is the founder and CEO of Silver Icing Inc. And that's a company that has become one of the most successful social selling clothing platforms in BC by focusing on empowering women. Please join me in welcoming Christina Marcano. Hi, thank you. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I was wondering what everybody's biggest challenge was that they faced this week, because I think the biggest challenge that I faced was trying to figure out how to fit over 15 years of an entrepreneurial journey into 10 minutes. So I'm going to give it a go. I feel like my journey is crucial in understanding how we built silver racing into what it is today. Uh, so I'm going to try and give you as many details as I can. So in 20, or sorry, in 2004, I started a clothing company called Skyler. We were manufacturing across, um, we were manufacturing in Vancouver and selling to boutiques across Canada. We also opened three stores. Things were going well, but then we got hit with the 2008 recession and sales suffered. We closed the stores and I went on Dragon's Den. But with, sever with suffering sales, I'm sure you can imagine how Kevin O'Leary responded. We didn't get a deal, but I got a lot of drama, which was good for ratings. A manufacturer saw us on the show and contacted me. We did a deal. We shut Skylar down and started a new company called Silver Icing, and we moved all of our production to Asia. It was a huge learning experience, and I spent the next two years designing, manufacturing, and selling my collections to boutiques across Canada. We also opened an online store. In two, uh, sorry, 2012, our manufacturer increased our minimums in order to proceed. So I went all in. I was six months pregnant and I sold the heck out of that collection. We exceeded target and I was super proud. But our manufacturer got nervous and didn't produce the collection. The problem is, is he didn't tell me until three weeks before it was supposed to deliver. I was devastated. I had to cancel all of the orders that our retailers had placed with us. And um, we had invested every last penny into selling that collection. So we were now broke. We had no way to recoup what we had spent. All I had at the time was a little bit of inventory. So I started setting up pop-up shops in my living room and hosting parties for people to come and shop. I then started taking them to other people's houses. And a few friends joined me and started doing the same. We called it the stylist program. Over the course of a year, we signed up 25 stylists. But a couple of things really just didn't sit well with me. Pop-up shops were most successful on Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. The stylist opportunity was a great way to earn extra income, but we were essentially removing all of their family time in order to do it. The other thing is, is fashion's always changing. So even though pop-up shops were usually very successful, on the way out, customers would always ask me, let me know when all the new samples arrive. And everything that they had just seen was now old. So as a stylist, that meant my customer base had to be very widespread and I would be investing in a lot of samples and or inventory. <clears throat> the whole point was to help women earn money not burden them with inventory or samples. So I went to the place where a lot of great ideas come from, the shower, and as I was washing my hair, it occurred to me that we were trying to build an opportunity that would solve our business needs. And what we really needed to do was build an opportunity that would solve the needs of our stylists. Our stylists all had one thing in common, and that was their access to internet. So why force an in-person pop-up shop when they could just sell online? So we launched the first only online stylist opportunity. 
stylists started building their shopping communities online, usually through Facebook, where they would quite literally work on their own schedule. We provided the marketing materials, the inventory, the distribution, so that the stylist can earn a commission without having to financially invest. We launched the stylist program on September 6 of 2014, and we now have over 7,000 stylists in Canada, all working from the comfort of their internet. So as we've heard described today, we are often called an online retailer. And if you go to our website, that's exactly what we look like. But silver icing evolved to where we are today because of the community that lies below the surface. And that community is honestly the secret behind our success. I have many different ex examples of how effective they are, uh, but we only have 10 minutes. So let's take a look at one of them. So let me start by asking a question. What do you think the biggest challenge an online clothing retailer has to overcome? So I'm going to assume that in 2022, most people here have now purchased something online. So from the shopper's perspective, what's the hardest part about buying clothes online? Fit, right? Or size. How, as a shopper, do you translate what you see online into how it's going to fit you? You probably won't be surprised to hear that the in industry average return rate for online clothing is over 35%. It's a major concern for onliners, especially when you start adding in all the shipping costs associated with uh, making those returns. So what's our return rate? Silver icing averages a 7% return rate. When we had bricks and mortar retail stores, I was spending a lot of time with women in fitting rooms and something became very clear to me. We would have two um, identically sized women. And by that, I mean, if you took a measuring tape and measured them, they would be the exact same measurements. And they might come in and one would leave with a medium and one would leave with a large. And they would both feel like they got the size that fits them because one preferred her clothing to be fitted and one preferred it to be a little bit looser. But they would leave the store with different sizes, feeling like they really got the right size for them. And that's because clothing for women is not about size, it's about fit. And in my experience, describing fit through software or measurements is just, it's never gonna work. The reason we have such a low return rate is because our stylists are able to communicate directly with our customers in real terms. They understand the fit preference directly from the customer who can talk to them because they know them, they're in a relatable position. They take that information, the stylist takes that information back to our community of other stylists and asks for opinions. So what they're doing is they're essentially crowdsourcing fit information that's tailored to the specific needs the customer has communicated. This results in an incredibly accurate recommendation that aligns with our customer's expectations and results in one of the industry's lowest return rates. So that's just one example of the power of social or conversational retail. There's a ton of examples I have, but our quest is to continue building silver icing into being an innovative business that both fulfills the needs of our stylist community and our customers. We are doing all of it from our head office in Surrey. And although we started in our basement also in Surrey, <laughs> Just over seven years ago, we have now grown to over 100 employees. And as of this week, we are in the process of completing the purchase of our new 32,000 square foot warehouse, which is kind of mind blowing. But that's a, a bit of a rundown of the entire story. I can't wait till we get to the questions so that we can get into the nitty gritty of um, the theory behind how we got here. Thanks, Michelle. Wow, thank you for that, Christina. I do have lots of questions <laughs> because <laughs> what a fantastic story and all these examples of, of uh, overcoming challenges and problem solving. It sounds like you've just come up with so many uh, ways to address different problems and, and challenges that have come up throughout the cor course of your journey. So I would love to get into that uh, more a little bit later. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you. Our next speaker now. And the final speaker for this morning is the people and culture manager of Sunrise Kitchens. And that's a leading kitchen cabinet maker offering custom kitchen cabinet design, manufacturing, renovations, installation, 
and solutions. Welcome, Amrita Bogle. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'd like to thank Surrey Board of Trade for this opportunity and platform for our local community to come together and share our experiences. Uh, my family has deep roots in entrepreneurship from starting a business in India to immigrating to Canada um, and starting a new venture in our own home garage back in 1983, uh, manufacturing kitchen cabinets. Um, I was always surrounded with uh, determination and leadership. And for me, that meant that I always had a side hustle going on. Um, whether it was me, an eight-year-old selling freezies in the hot summer, in the hot summers, um, or starting my event planning company at the age of 19. I knew I wanted to be in business and help people unlock their full potential. Therefore, HR had become my passion. I am the third generation owner here at Sunrise Kitchens as the people and culture leader. Um, although I started my journey back when I was 14, answering that first phone call at the reception desk, um, I've now joined the business full time since 2017 after my graduation. Um, Sunrise Kitchen serves the fam a multifamily uh, market here with kitchen cabinets um, that are manufactured in a 90,000 square foot facility and with 130 team members um, in Surrey. Uh, we've been through multiple expansions over the last decade, uh, with the last one being our largest one focused on Industry 4.0 and automation in our manufacturing. Each of my family members are in the business together. Uh, my dad, Paul, he's the CEO, my mom, Harjinder, who is the accounts payable manager, and my brother, Navjot, who is the business ad analyst. Together, we all work together, uh, coming to the business every day um, to help succeed Sunrise Kitchens. So my journey as the people and culture leader um, started um, in my career after graduating from Human Resources. Um, I did have a title change mid-career to people and culture because I had become obsessed with how uh, a workplace culture should be in an organization that allows everyone to enjoy their work. Um, so my philosophy is that people are your greatest assets, therefore investing in them is my top priority. Um, so culture was also important due to the constant change and growth that we continue to have here at Sunrise. So it supported the education, the continuous improvement, um, the engaged workforce and the forward thinking teams through methods that we introduced with Kaizen and Lean Concepts. Uh, we also built a culture roadmap that continues to change as our growth happens and our philosophy to become, um, to be on the path of journey to world class and, and as industry leaders. As people in culture, I also work with other associations um, to help shine a light on the culture of their companies and to help create this awareness so their people um, are fully empowered to shine in their company. So some successful trips that I have come across through my journey um, is definitely a first is the new perspectives. Um, so as business owners, sometimes I feel uh, that uh, we can get blocked with just our own perspectives and our own thinking, um, whereas uh, opening up and getting curious, going on business trips, exploring other operations in your industry, and then just broadening your networks through that uh, gets you out of the way um, of the, the way we always do things. Um, so being also a part of your industry associations to be a voice. Um, I also sit on the CKCA board member, um, which is a Canadian National Kitchen Cabinet Association in Canada. This allows me to also uh, bring in valuable knowledge into Sun Sunrise and then also gives me an opportunity to teach others in our industry about the people and culture side. Uh, other perspectives that you can help um, in bring into your company is uh, to bring on co-op students, um, practicum students, interns, recent graduates, uh, to support your local generations. 
Um, these, these students or these recent grads also are a great asset to your company as it, they bring fresh perspectives, new education, um, and it helps you delegate some of your work so you can give out some projects to them and they'll be able to complete it in a professional manner. Um, last thing I would say on the perspective side is to introduce 360 degree surveys on business owners, so ourselves and our team leads. Um, this allows for the organization to bring uh, forth an honest opinion on what they think anonymously. Um, and it also gives you an opportunity to reflect on how you're uh, moving forward with your business and maybe what things that you may need to change according to what the messages from the people are. Um, so a second uh, part to this would be growth. Um, I feel like Sunrise has become an expert in growing. Um, in the last uh, couple of years, uh, we've had to really unlearn and then relearn. So I think a lot of business owners sometimes uh, miss out on this opportunity that we grow with um, the same old processes, um, but definitely you'll see those gaps um, when you're growing. Um, so to make sure that you're always relearning your business um, is always providing a better uh, platform for growth. Um, and then to be reflective and adaptive. Um, so being reflective on what didn't work and then why it didn't work or what did work and why it did work and then being adaptive to those situations. So adapting the change through strategic planning on how to um, adopt change for a smoother, smoother transition. Um, so as I said, Sunrise went through its very largest expansion in the last couple of years. Um, so we had to be ready for our people uh, to accept this change. Um, so one way we did it was we brought in um, a mindset of continuous improvement and uh, we adopted the methodology of Kaizen. So Kaizen is the way to change for the better. And this allowed the people to really start thinking out of the box and to start accepting the new processes and procedures that may be coming their way with this growth. Um, communication was always key as well. Over communicating than under communicating, I would highly recommend um, because your people sometimes may be lost in all this change. Um, so reconnecting back to your why, uh, why you're doing this growth, what will come out of it for not just the business and yourself, but also as a team um, and where the team lies in the future. Um, another uh, aspect of growth is having uh, generalist positions versus functional experts. Um, so a, a way you could look at this that if you were in a smaller business, you may have one person doing 20 different tasks. Um, that may be okay for that size of business, but as you grow, that one person is not able to do that many tasks anymore. So creating those functional experts um, are always key um, in your growth because that allows you to fully um, harness that position and be able to train that person just on those duties. Um, it also allows you to have an easier transition if you're bringing people from outside in those functional experts rather than that generalist position. Um, lastly, I guess I would talk about some obstacles that I have felt coming into um, you know, this male dominated industry and just as a third generation owner, um, the pressure to perform. Um, now, I think that all business owners feel this pressure. And um, my thing was that it was there was a guilt of not doing enough. Um, so compromising my personal life and well being and just making sure that I'm always working on the business. Uh, this led to burnout, obviously. And um, from there, uh, in my late 20s, um, I decided to do a lifestyle type of change. Um, I adjusted my expectations again, and you know, which brought me to self care routines, which allowed more of my brain to have that creative space. So when I did come to work, I was fully 100% there, then giving my 50% every single day. Um, another obstacle was creating a trusting environment and boundaries with my coworkers. So as um, in the reflection of other people, I am one of the owners here at Sunrise. So as human resources, sometimes that can become 
um, a little bit of a challenge where people may not be as open, um, but I definitely worked on this by creating a trusting environment, um, by keeping my conversations confidential and not bringing them into, um, you know, other owners. And that allowed a, a very smooth transition for this um, HR journey of mine. Um, the last thing I would say is uh, don't leave your voice on the table. Um, sometimes as women, uh, we're sitting in a boardroom and we may not be heard, but I think building experiences via business trips brings you the upper hand in confidence and allows you to fully project of what you're trying to uh, move forward with and your decisions and your thoughts. Um, so definitely building that network allows you to have a strong voice. And that's what uh, really helped me as well. Um, so those are, um, that's my journey here at Sunrise. And uh, thank you for listening. Amrita, thank you very much. I love that you talked about self-care. Uh, that is so important, especially in these times. And, um, you know, you talk about relearning and adapting. So many of us have learned those lessons over these last two years. Thank, thank you for speaking to those. Thank you to all our speakers uh, this morning. And we're now going to proceed to the question and answer portion of the morning. If you have a question, please go ahead and type it into the chat function and I can ask them for you. And if I am unable to get to your question this morning, uh, we will try to get a response for you afterwards. I'd like to start with a question about uh, the skills that you needed in, in getting started in your business. Uh, Angela, you talked about how, you know, at one point you never, you thought you'd never go into entrepreneurship. Uh, what, what skills did you, did you use to overcome that? Um, I'm a big fan of learning or like, you know, doing some formal learning, learning through books or courses. And I was fortunate enough to learn about ACE tech. So ACE tech in Vancouver, the Vancouver area, uh, I keep saying, um, they're based downtown. Um, they have, um, CEO training and not just CEO training, but it's a, it's a group for CEOs in te the technology industry. So they also had like a one or two year program where um, they had a, you know, a bunch of foundational things for what it means to be a CEO, CEO with the technology bent. And then also um, they had round tables. So, you know, a big thing I learned about being in business and meeting with entrepreneurs is find other entrepreneurs. So, you know, sometimes it's really hard to talk to your, um, you know, your partners, family members, or even your staff. So oftentimes you, you can feel quite alone when solving or dealing with some tough problems. So having really a bit of a support group um, with other entrepreneurs was, was key as well. Okay, so having that network uh, yeah. available to you. Yeah. And Christina, I, you know, I was really struck by uh, how you came up with idea after idea, you know, sometimes thinking in the shower uh, to try and solve those problems and those challenges. Um, what are your, uh, wh what's your advice for that? You know, what are the, what's the process for thinking outside the box for you? What are the, the questions that you ask yourself to get to those solutions? So I think the most <clears throat> important thing that I've done in, in my career is um, listening. And, you know, often that is taken quite literally and people want to go out and do some, you know, um, market research and go and ask their customers, what do you want? So if I went and asked my customers, what do you want? They might tell me what they think I could offer them. They're not necessarily um, going to be the ones that will identify maybe some solutions to the actual problems that they have. So you need to look beyond, um, what they're saying and listen to what they're not saying. And <clears throat> that's, um, I think the fitting room example is a really good example of that. They weren't telling me you need to, you know, figure out the exact uh, size and communicate to me what the size is. They were saying, I've got a fit preference and this is how I want it to fit. And how can we translate that into, um, you know, developing or innovating your business concept or your ideas. So I think that was 
very key for me and not necessarily something I heard a lot in the beginning. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Marita, you talked a lot about um, dealing with your workforce and, you know, so many businesses these days are facing uh, workforce challenges in terms of hiring and retaining. What advice do you have for keeping your employees uh, happy uh, and ensure that they do stay with you? Michelle, I think that's the golden question during COVID. Um, I know a lot of businesses were facing uh, labor shortages in our industry and uh, something that really helped us, uh, you know, hone into our current expertise was creating that culture. Um, having that culture that your company believes uh, allows everyone to flourish and then share their ideas gives other people opportunities to continue to work there. Um, no one wants to work in a job where they're not being listened to or not being heard. Um, so introducing concepts like Kaizen or Lean um, to help everyone to bring them together and share their ideas allows them to feel that they're part of the business, right? We don't want people just working thinking they're just going to a business and working. We want them to feel that this is their business as well. Um, so I would say focus on your culture and then focus on those touch points. These generations that are coming into the workforce, they want more value and they want to see that you care about them. So giving them the extra attention, asking them how they're doing in their first week, keeping in contact with them um, really helps for you to understand if they're a good fit and allows them to also uh, see where their journey can be with your company. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll go back to you, Angela. Earlier, Amrita talked about you know the challenges of of uh, persevering in in a male dominated industry. I'm wondering what uh, what that's been like for you as an entrepreneur uh, in tech, uh, especially. Uh, what has that been like, and and what's helped you persevere? Well, it's it's kind of interesting because I like I've always felt like a little bit like I was at you know, in a bit of competition and trying to be better than the boys, like even from a young age, right? I wanted to be just as fast as them, just as strong, you know, do better at school and, you know, do car mechanics, like do the the non-typical, you know, say girl things, which I hate kind of saying now. Um, but I was always trying to, you know, kind of prove myself. And, but, you know, for a while, you know, in university and, you know, even in starting my first business, I didn't really think about it anymore. It was like, okay, I don't, it wasn't like in my frontal cortex. And then, um, you know, when a lot of the articles and stuff started coming out, like in Silicon Valley and, you know, a lot of, you know, articles talking about how many, um, you know, men are, or how many women versus men um, are investment bankers or venture capitalists. And so it wasn't until that happened, it's been fairly recent where I really, it came back again. Um, and, um, you know, it is a bit of a challenge, you know, there's different biases and different dynamics in some business conversations. And, um, you know, I think for me personally, I felt like because there was so much talk about it, it, um, it took away my confidence. So mm. before I was kind of acting oblivious to it and now it was like front and center. So now I'm like overanalyzing everything. Right. And so, so how did you get over that? Yeah. I don't know if I'm over it yet. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I think, yeah, it, it, it isn't, I, I think it's an honest answer is I don't think I'm over it yet because um, it's still a challenge. The numbers are still there. Um, I think the, I think what we're seeing though is that I haven't necessarily changed what I'm doing, but the world has. And so, you know, there's more funds where they're hiring more women and you know, there's more women VCs that are kind of stepping forward and saying, okay, we're going to invest in women-led companies. And so I feel like, um, you know, I, I guess I try not to think about it as much and overanalyze it as much, um, but it still exists, but it's improving. So it's, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking about it now. You do, you do what you do. 
and 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 you do yeah. it well and that speaks for itself yeah, um and, so christina it, it, to you you're in a period i mean as all of you are really in the, of, of this really incredible growth like you've got this new um warehouse uh expansive warehouse what are the challenges of that of of growing a company and what are your tips for 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 doing so oh boy um you know, growing the company has definitely been more of a challenge uh, than I thought it was going to be, I, you know, especially starting. So when we first started, we were in my basement and um, it took off really quickly. That's when the online stylist program happened. And when it first happened, we had 10 stylists sign up the first day, 10 the next day, 10 the next day, 10 the next day. And that's like where our hockey stick of growth happened. Um, and so we just started having to get some help. And so by the time we actually were able to secure our first warehouse, we had 12 people working in the basement of, don't tell the city of Surrey, but we were, had 12 people working in the basement. I think they're listening. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they actually came and talked to us. It was really, um, it was good timing because we had just finalized our uh, warehouse at the time. But yeah, we had 12 people coming here and that was overwhelming. You know, we had my kids here and it was my home. Um, and then going into our first warehouse, it felt ginormous. I'll never forget walking into it. It was 3,500 square feet. And I was very scared, to be honest. I thought this is too big. And it was in within six months, we had pallets overflowing into our uh, parking lot. And we were forced to go and find another warehouse. That one ended up 14,000 square feet, moved into that again, thinking it was, you know, way too big and uh, within a year we were overgrown. So we are now in four warehouses that are separate um, and the operational challenges that come along with that are, I can't even explain how difficult that's been. Uh, but with the city of Surrey, we've got, or actually the whole uh, Vancouver lower mainland area, I think it's like less than a half a percent vacancy rate. So being able to grow the business and find the location and being able to do that, um, you know, seamlessly and successfully has been a huge challenge. And I'm not really sure I have, you know, a great answer as to how we've dealt with it. We've been very um, bootstrappy. I've spent a lot of time, long days, getting in, helping fulfill orders and, uh, really trying to keep the operation running smoothly with really not enough space to do it. So, um, and even with all that being said, I'm still petrified over the fact that we just signed for a, a new 32,000 square foot lease. It feels humongous, right? Um, but I'm, you know, hopefully we won't run out of room too quickly. But. <laughs> yes, that's a lot of room. I'm imagining all the clothes, filling it all up, rows oh and rows. God. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So, so I guess the question to the answer is like, how do you deal with it? I mean, we just deal with it one day at a time and we do our best to try and project out and make the best decisions um, without over committing ourselves too much. But I think the closer you are to the business um, and the more willing you are to jump into all the areas and don't rely on, I mean, for me, I, I don't rely on other people coming in and kind of saving the day. I really take you know, responsibility for that and, and try to make it a good environment for everybody that works for us. But keeping your pulse on the business, I think it's been key. Being hands on. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, we have about five minutes left. I'd love, I'd love to just uh, go around with all of you, just uh, with your advice, uh, as, as many women out there who would want uh, to start their own business right now, it's, it's a challenging time to do so. What advice would you give them uh, right now? Um, I'll start with you, Armita. Sure. Um, I think starting a business, uh, you have to connect to your why. Um, so really coming in and understanding why you want to start a business will help you keep driven and even in those tough times and those challenges where you want to give up. Um, so creating that why and then documenting it and then having it in front of you every single day gives you that motivation. So I would say, you know, you go ahead, start your business and you'll learn as you take your steps forward. Um, starting a business doesn't mean you need to know everything up front um, in terms of all the challenges. It's just uh, as 
Christina said, day by day, um, you go and you tackle those problems. So that's my advice. And uh, Christina, to you, and then I'm, I actually have a couple of really good questions uh, from the audience that I'd like to get to, but just a, a quick uh, bit of advice you'd like to give to someone who's starting out right now. Yeah, so I think um, the important thing to know is that it looks like uh, business owners have it all figured out. And I know when I first started, I was really focused on feeling guilty about the fact that I wasn't spending more time on a business plan. And I, there was a, quite a number of times where I sat down and really tried to write out a business plan. Um, and to be honest, had I been successful at fully writing it out, it would no, look nothing like what we are today. Um, so I would just caution people, you know, definitely go into it with a plan, but be prepared and expect to evolve that plan uh, very quickly because <laughs> It will take you in the right direction and head you in the right journey, um, but you really need to be able to adapt and look at the needs of what your customers are going to have. And sometimes you're really not going to be able to figure that out in the beginning. So right. I would uh, I would say just be adaptable and and work through it. Things change over time. Uh, a really great question here for you. I'll, I'll put this to you, Christina, because you talked about working from your basement. Harleen is asking, as an entrepreneur, how do you take off the pressure to not be working around the clock and still have a balanced schedule? That safe care, uh, self care that Armita was talking about earlier. <clears throat> yeah. So I get asked this question a lot, and you know, I struggle with it because I want to say that. I have always had balance, but I, I really haven't. Um, I think, you know, part of becoming an entrepreneur is a very deep commitment in the beginning to do what you need to do. And <clears throat> there, it, that goes up and down for me. I mean, I really, I've committed to field trips. I never miss a field trip. I'm always the mom who drives and I attend them. Um, so there's certain things that are hard, like this is what I do. Um, we also really commit to vacations and having those vacation times, hopefully once a year. We haven't had it in the last couple of years, but we are going pretty soon. Um, but other than that, in terms of the daily, the daily grind, I, I mean, it will go up and down for me. And in the beginning, it was very long nights. So when we first started manufacturing in Asia, um, I was having to communicate through the night. So I had just had a baby. So I would be with him all during the day. And then, you know, between the hours of 11 and 4 p.m., I would be communicating um, as much as I could. My house was a total disaster and I would sleep in the morning with him. Um, and I just did what I needed to do to make it work. Um, it gets better, but there has been times like last fall, we were out of room. We were 40,000 orders behind I can't even describe how many orders that is printed out. Um, and I had to pretty much stop everything that I was doing. I was doing 16 hours a day on the floor, trying to improve our processes and, and get those orders out. So it goes up and down. And, um, you know, if balance is something that you're looking for, uh, I don't know if entrepreneurship is something I would <laughs> recommend because realistically it's very hard to do. Um, but you do get to, control it a little bit. It's always up and down. Like I'll be able to, you know, have times where I don't invest all of my time in the business. And then sometimes I have to. So. And it sounds like you've chosen certain things to really prioritize in your life and make sure that you, that, that you do uh, take time to do them. Yeah. That is it for our questions uh, and uh, our, our time for questions. It's been such a pleasure to ask uh, all of you uh, about your business and your journeys as entrepreneurs. Thank you very much for your time, Angela, Christina, and Amrita. Um, I'll take you back now to your CEO, Anita Huberman. Great. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thank you so much, Michelle. And uh, everyone, such inspiring stories, uh, really, as women, uh, we face uh, very unique challenges, and it's so um, actually comforting to know that we face similar challenges uh, as we go through leadership um, of our organizations and of our businesses and in our community involvement. And remember that success is a journey, not a destination. Thank you so much to our co-presenting sponsor, KPU's Melville School of Business. Thank you so much to CBC British Columbia, to the fabulous Michelle Elliott. And remember, we have some amazing upcoming events. We're returning to in-person uh, events very shortly. 
Check us out at businessinsurrey.com.